We have chosen for the first seminar this season a subject which perhaps is more vital and more far-reaching uh, than might be first presumed. There is probably no school in the history of Western civilization that has more profoundly affected the course of human life for the last 19 centuries than the school of Neoplatonism. I realize that this will be challenged, or might be challenged, but I think as we proceed, the facts will be clear. As you know, a sentence taken out of a book has slight meaning when divided from its context. And there is no way of estimating Neoplatonism without first orienting it in the world of its time and conditions. So we must first prepare our groundwork by a general survey of the circumstances which made Neoplatonism not only possible but necessary. We know that 2,000 years ago civilization was centered in the Mediterranean and Aegean areas. In this region three great cultures flourished. The Egyptian, the Greek, and the Latin or Roman. If we examine history at about the time of the rise of Neoplatonism, we observe that all three of these great dominant cultures were beginning to show signs of internal weakness or had already fallen. We know that the glory of Egypt was past, and the Egyptians were little better uh, than a colony of Rome. Greece was in the same predicament. The old days of the great academy had vanished. Greek culture, Greek philosophy, Greek religion was declining. The last stronghold of the old world, old way of the world, was Rome. Rome under the Caesars. And Rome was already beginning to feel the inroads of the barbarian hordes from the north. And Rome was tottering on the brink of its own collapse. Now three great cultures, three dominant civilizations, cannot collapse or fail or gradually disintegrate and fall apart without producing a profound effect upon human beings. We live within systems. We live within patterns. And we know today what it means to experience insecurity in the patterns which are familiar to us. How much more, then, were these older people insecure when their entire system of culture was collapsing, when their religion was slowly failing, their sciences declining, their arts failing, their literatures and philosophies, their ethics and morality, all these which are the foundations of enduring security, were slipping away from these three great ancient cultures. In this period of tremendous internal uncertainty, it is inevitable that men's minds should have gradually turned toward a different perspective on life, a perspective that was best expressed, best revealed through the three schools that rose in this period, Christianity, Gnosticism, and Neoplatonism. All three share one common heritage, the heritage of disillusionment. All three appeared at a critical time 
in the life of the people of the region where they flourished. All three are marked deeply and profoundly with the prevailing sense of insecurity. Therefore, we have some understanding of the psychology of that time. Neoplatonism, or the New Platonism, claims its original inspiration and descent from the writings of Plato and his legitimate successors and disciples. Let us then pause for a moment and consider the relationship of philosophy to Greek life. To a very great degree, philosophy had divided Greek life very strongly. Step by step, it had overthrown the power of Greek religion. The Greek was more impressed by the value of his philosophy than by the importance of the state religion. Part of this was due uh, to such magnificent dialogues as those attributed to Socrates. Part was due to the natural instinct of philosophy in comparison to the elaborate pageantry of theology. The philosophers were mostly modest, moderate human beings. They did not believe in ostentation. They had very little time or consideration for elaborate rituals and rites, nor were they much addicted to the prevailing superstitions of their times. And although these men lived and flourished in the great golden era of paganism, sometimes called the Age of Pericles, as individuals and collectively, they never accepted or subscribe to the prevailing state theologies. Uh, they were discreet, they were respectful for the most part, sometimes not entirely so. But they felt that these systems of state religion were themselves becoming gradually encrusted with superstitions and were falling inevitably into the hands of privileged classes to be used as ways and means to further enslave and dominate the individual, restrict his liberty and freedom and his right to think. Thus, the philosophical systems of Greece, whether they be the doctrines of Plato and Aristotle, or the more rationalistic concepts of the Stoa, all of these emphasized a reasonable, rational, natural world. Even when the deities are introduced, these deities are introduced in a rather matter-of-fact manner. They are not introduced with great solemnity, but they are accepted, interpreted, and organized and arranged to become part of a very natural, proper kind of world. A world in which, for the Greek, there was very little emphasis upon what we would term today mysticism. It is true that the Orphics were mystics. But by the time Orphic doctrine had passed through Pythagoras and Plato, very largely its mystical content had been redirected into fields of philosophy. The Greeks considered the human being and his salvation a very serious business. They considered it something that would call upon the greatest resources of the individual and the greatest learning possible to man. They had no concept of an easy salvation. They had no concept of an individual praying his way into grace. To them, to live well was hard work demanding tremendous strength of character, dedication, and resolution. And it was further part of their belief that the salvation of man depended upon the growth, development, and release of his own intelligence, that the individual could not subdue himself into a state of spirituality. He must unfold, extend, richen, and strengthen 
all the aspects of his character. The Greek philosophers also turned against the patrician system of their time. They had very little time or consideration for the power of wealth, family traditions, hereditary authority. Like Confucius, they held the individual to be the important equation. Not where he came from, not where he went, not what he had, not what he lost, but what he was. And their entire philosophy was built upon uh, the problem of improving and increasing the content of man and releasing into expression those potentials which they held to be eternal within man. It is obvious from this approach the division existed in the Greek state on the level of philosophy and religion at a comparatively ancient time. And this division was not mended during the golden age of Greek philosophy. The interval was widened, and Plato's approach was a very natural, systematic, and understandable one. He sought to use the gods of his people as a means of advancing their own knowledge. He used them as the elements of a great symbolical or allegorical system and he caused these gods to become elements in a great ethics, a great concept of life. Therefore, we realize that he gradually impersonalized the Olympian deities. He transformed them into what he affirmed to be their natural and proper state, namely names or persons attributed by men to principles and that behind each deity as a symbol was a reality, a principle. These principles he called intelligibles, because he affirmed and maintained that these principles had to be known by a process of conception. Man could conceive of them. He could not think of them as we use the term mentality. Intelligibles were conceptions in consciousness, archetypal beings, and these were the true gods. From these, men had created a descent of symbols by which these intelligible beings were caused to appear under forms or in guises and shapes which were called intellectual. And the intellectual deities were those which man could rationally contemplate and which he could conceive within his mind to a degree of understanding. The intelligible deities could not be essentially understood. The intellectual deities could be. Thus we see the traces of an important psychological doctrine. We see the gradual rise of ideas concerning the essential nature of the universe itself. During his long career, Plato passed through three distinct periods. The first of these might be termed his political career, and uh, this led to the final disillusionment in which he decided that public office was not the best way in which he could serve his fellow Grecians. So he retired from, from politics and created his school and became a teacher, declaring it was wiser to be a teacher of men than a leader of men. This school continued for a number of years through the long and active life of Plato, and perhaps the outstanding episode in the development of this school was the contact with Aristotle who was brought to him as a young man and placed under his care. Aristotle became his most critical, at the same time most brilliant, disciple. And uh, the Athenian school is recognized as having produced these two extraordinarily different but remarkably enlightened men. In the third period of his life, Plato began to drift away from philosophy. 
he began to drift towards the inevitable end of philosophic contemplation, namely that the individual becomes more and more aware of the great intelligibles or eternals subsisting forever in nature and in time and in eternity, would naturally contemplate them, would feel himself more and more akin to these vast principles, which he had first discovered intellectually and later meditated upon intelligibly. This led toward the third part of Plato's career, which has been termed the theological. And we know that in the last years of his life, perhaps the last 10 or 15 years, he wrote extensively upon what we would term today mystical subjects. Unfortunately, so far as is known, none of these writings have survived or if they have, they have not been uh, revealed or given to modern scholarship. We know, however, that it was this change in Plato which caused the division between Plato and Aristotle, and finally resulted in Plato bringing his nephew Spusippus to become the head of his school, and Aristotle departed to the cinder track to create the school which has since carried the name the peripatetic or walking philosophers because they held discourse while walking on the cinder track. Aristotle was unable to accompany Plato in his vast excursion into abstraction. But we know from the general tone of his later dialogues but Plato was moving more and more toward a very reverent attitude in relation to the great principles that lie at the roots of things. Philosophy with him had borne its natural fruit. It had released his intuitive and apperceptive powers, and these drew him toward the experience of the realities which, about which he had reasoned and thought. He intimates something of this in the Socratic Dialogues, where he causes Socrates to point out uh, that man is drawn inevitably toward the grave, or toward the transition to another life, in which either there will be darkness, or else the person surviving as a spiritual being will find union with those principles and truths which he has sought and served and will know through factual experience that which previously has been only theory, speculation, or judgment. And Plato himself moved precisely in this direction, and it is greatly to be regretted that his religious writings have not survived. The motion of Platonism itself, therefore, established a pattern, a pattern which we have more or less ignored, but which was still alive and vital in the opening years of the Christian era within three and a half centuries of the lifetime of Plato himself. Now with this background uh, relating to Platonism, we must come then to the transition to the Neoplatonic school of thought. Neoplatonism was rooted in the three cultures uh, which were passing into desuetude at that time. Plato, Neoplatonism perhaps had its original seat in Alexandria. If so, it had a secondary seat in Rome and a third in Athens. These three centers became the legs of the Neoplatonic tripod, and it was from this tripod that the oracles of this particular sect or group uh, were pronounced. The principal leader of the Alexandrian Neoplatonists was Plotinus, although the sect is said to have been created by Ammoniasarchus, a slave, a carrier of burdens, a man of no known scholastic attainments, but a great natural intuitionalist. This original foundation led gradually toward the establishment of Neoplatonism in Rome through, again, the migrations of Plotinus and his establishment 
of a school in the eternal city. Neoplatonism flourished in Rome and Alexandria for some time, and it was not until the early part of the 5th century that the foundations were established in Greece. This foundation, the important one, was set in motion by Proclus, who was one of the students of the older Platonic writings, also of earlier, less known Neoplatonists, and who has sometimes been referred to as the Platonic successor. Proclus was born in Constantinople, then Byzantium. He moved to Athens, where he spent most of his life in teaching. Finally, as the result of the uh, religious differences of the time, particularly uh, the intervention of Christianity, he was in exile for a short time in the Near East, but later returned and finally died in Athens. Proclus was a man of exceptional abilities, and he may be regarded as the last of the great lights of Neoplatonism. So we see the development of this school itself over a period of some 250 years, from Ammonia Saccus and Plotinus, who were the, the originators or the creators of the basic concept, uh, to Proclus of Athens, who was the last great representative, and finally to Boethius, who is sometimes called the last of the pagans, the last of the great line of philosopher mystics who basically clung to the ancient Greco-Latin uh, religious philosophy of life. Uh, these uh, followers, these disciples of the old way, were gradually exterminated, and the last of the pagan academies in the Roman Empire uh, were closed by the Emperor Justinian. So by degrees, Neoplatonism disappeared uh, from the theater of human action. But its disappearance has sometimes been said to be the beginning of its existence. For nothing that it accomplished during the 250 years in which it flourished uh, can compare with what it has accomplished in the 15 or more centuries since it perished. Thus we may say that the effect of the belief was vastly in excess of its temporal authority during the periods of its flourishing and survival. Now what is the essential difference, let us say, between the teachings of Plato and the New Platonism, or Neoplatonism of Plotinus. It is a difference which is undoubtedly rooted in the points which we have previously made, namely that these civilizations had, since the time of Plato, fallen into decline, and the entire world of the learned was suffering from a profound nostalgia. The old ways, with their natural positive statements of life were not sufficient to meet the neurosis of dying dynasties, and the change is exemplified in the motion of the philosophic system. Neoplatonism is then primarily to be defined as a motion of Platonism toward theology. In other words, it is the rise of Platonism as a religion. Now in Plato, we have most of the elements necessary for a theological system. Augustine of Hippo points out the weaknesses, and these weaknesses were the cause of the ultimate failure of Neoplatonism as a motion, as a motion in society. St. Augustine tells us, for example, that Neoplatonism has no martyr. It had no one at the beginning of it who was a superhuman divine figure, a tremendous catalyzing agent to draw and hold the imagination of people. It lacked the understandable dramatic person. Plato was not suitable to fulfill this need because of his tremendously rationalistic attitude toward life. 
the profundity and breadth of his knowledge and the comparative simplicity and naturalness of his way. He was not surrounded by miracles. He was not an individual who made any claims to a divine heritage. He did not advance himself as in any way the peculiar mouthpiece of deity or of truth. He was simply what he claimed to be, a philosopher, a truth seeker. And uh, St. Augustine points out that this is not enough to hold and capture the fancies of multitudes of persons. The second thing that, according to Augustine, was deficient in Neoplatonism was a simple and natural program for the achievement of salvation. Uh, the process of platonic improvement, the individual bestowing all of his energies, concentrating all of his resources upon the tremendous substance of the search for reality, a search in which the student had to give all, of St. Augustine said, could not and would not hold popular belief. Because popular belief does not want to sacrifice. It does not want to give up. It wants to have and be saved at the same time. It wants to keep its faults and have these forgiven. And there was nothing in Platonism to substantiate this concept. The third point that St. Augustine brought to bear upon the uh, subject was that in all and in substance, the doctrines of Neoplatonism were not understandable by those who had not devoted many years to scholarship, that the terms and thoughts were too abstract to gain any large popular following. For these reasons, Augustine correctly predicted that the sect as a sect could not survive, that it could not produce from itself a permanent, enduring church, or an institution which could win and hold the imagination of generations then unborn. Uh, Augustine himself had many very complimentary things to say about Neoplatonism, and even when he claimed uh, to have separated from it, all of his writings are dominated by it. And one authority has stated not long ago that it is impossible to, de to detect the belief of the author of a book, whether he be a Neoplatonist or a Christian, unless he makes specific reference to Christ. Otherwise, the works are so similar, so comparatively identical, that it is impossible with certainty to distinguish which sect the author belonged to. This perhaps is even more complicated by the fact that many of the thinkers of that time belonged to both sects and considered it in no way heretical or unreasonable. <coughs> uh, the Bishop Synesius of Alexandria accepted uh, ordination as a bishop in the Christian church under the condition and proviso that he could remain a platonic philosopher in his private life. And the church accepted it, nor did it. So we have this uh, interesting uh, situation arising at the beginning of this belief, this sect. Now with this general representation of the difficulties, let us take a little time to examine some of the essential doctrines of Neoplatonism particularly the compilation that was prepared by Proclus in Athens in the 5th century, and which, is, uh, which survives to us as the books of Proclus on the theology of Plato. Uh, these books are no longer, as we say, known to exist, but it is possible that Proclus had access to manuscripts that have since been destroyed or have been buried or hidden where they have not been refound. 
But in any event, Proclus appears to have known or have made a very shrewd estimation of the dominant religious convictions of Plato during the closing years of his life. Now we remember also that this work of Proclus was one of the last of the Neoplatonic works. Therefore it represents the school in the closing cycle of its own brief but very spectacular existence. Deriving, however, much from Plotinus and other legitimate members of the Neoplatonic community, Proclus unfolds what he regards as the true key uh, to the Greek theology. He roots it, of course, in the mythology and in the religious beliefs of the ancient Greeks. But he follows first Plato and then Plotinus in gradually reducing the essential elements of this mythology to a scientific system, to a philosophical pattern of conceivable principles. The first thing, then, we must approach is the combined view of Proclus, Plato, and Plotinus on the essential nature of being, in, the, in that all else suspends from this essential concept. In this way, of course, Plato differs strongly from Aristotle. Aristotle begins with what might be termed the phenomenal existence, and ascends gradually toward a contemplation of abstract cause. Plato and the Neoplatonists begin with a positing of a conceivable abstract under the general concept of this intelligible being, a being beyond mind. Now this simple statement perhaps is the most important statement in all of Neoplatonism, the existence of a being beyond mind. Now, this was perhaps the first, also the first break uh, between Neoplatonism and the teaching of Plato. That is, that part of the teaching which we now know. It is very possible that this was the important change that Plato himself made. But we have no documentary proof of this. Certainly, however, the Neoplatonists lived much nearer to his time and might well have had access to a knowledge and tradition which we no longer possess. But Neoplatonism thus postulates a being beyond mind. Being beyond mind implies not only that it is beyond the mind of man, but that this being itself exists in a state superior to mind. Therefore, that this being is not mind and nor can it be conceived by mind. Therefore, Plotinus insists that this being uh, can only be extated as an existent exact, uh, reality or fact, a fact in being itself, but may not be subjected to any definition or interpretation that this being subsists forever in itself, of itself, and by itself, that it is without quantity or quality, that it is without limitation, or as we would assume, lack of limitation, because even this term implies some kind of restriction. It is neither extreme of one or the other, plus or minus, but remains forever totally enclosing within its own eternity the concepts of both plus and minus. Therefore it is being capable of being conceived as containing both being and not being, and yet now in no way being deficient in any of its own parts. Because it is beyond mind, because its primary nature is not mental, the Neoplatonists affirm that the universe 
is not primarily a rational sphere. Now this becomes exceedingly important as we study this system. This caused a tremendous hue and cry against Neoplatonism. A hue and cry which has continued all the way down to 19th century England and early 20th century America. It has been affirmed that by this concept, Neoplatonism attacks science, even the sciences of the Greeks, that also Neoplatonism attacked philosophy because of its primary statement that reality is beyond mind. Now all your sciences are seeking for truth, and truth is a term to cover at least the concept of reality. Science is completely frustrated if truth is beyond mind. Philosophy is frustrated, uh, frustrated because if philosophy is the instrument of reason and truth is beyond mind, then reason cannot attain to truth. This is in itself apparently a simple point but it becomes pivotal, and a great deal of other thinking is suspended from it. The, Soc the Socratic school, and to a degree Plato, had uh, created a triad, the one, the beautiful, and the good, to explain the nature of deity. Neoplatonism accepts the possibility of the term the good, as being negatively applicable to being, not as a definition, but merely as a convenient term for interchange between persons discussing such a subject. But they maintained that being transcends virtue to the same degree that it transcends mind. Therefore, that being per se transcends, period. Therefore, it cannot relate to, be similar to, or identical with anything less than itself. This procedure of thinking isolates the supreme being factor at the root of existence. It causes this root to exist in a pure state, unqualified and unconditioned by even such terms as spiritual and mystical. It further points out that all attempt on the part of man to approach the nature of infinite being must to a large degree fail for the reason that man has no attributes available to him as a conditioned creature by which he can actually apperceive the total nature of unconditioned and unlimited existence. Time and eternity fall into the abyss together. Spirit and matter as opposites fade into something superior to themselves. A creation objective and subjective merges into something that is objective, subjective plus, and for which no term is feasible or conceivable. Even the Chaldean theory statement of the thrice deep darkness at the root of light is not sufficient, because the Neoplatonists affirm definitely that being is not darkness, nor is being light. Therefore, it cannot be described in terms of light or dark. It cannot be determined in terms of sound or silence. It is simply, utterly, inconceivably transcendent. And because it is totally unconditioned, and because it possesses within itself no intellectual nature intrinsic to its own existence. 
It is, as they say, the infinite cause of infinites. And no being, no creature, no manifestation can any more circumscribe the potential of being uh, than he can uh, plumb the depths of being. Therefore, in a sense, the concept, with being all things are possible, comes to have meaning. All things imply not all known things, but all things known and unknown plus. And little by little, the concept of deity is elevated to such a complete abstraction that, as Augustine pointed out, the mind of man, in his own limited way, not only cannot follow the thinking, but cannot visualize the end of the quest. He cannot conceive either of peace or motion of rest or infinity, of immortality or mortality. All of these things disappear into an infinite mystery, a mystery that is totality. And this totality is very reminiscent of the most abstract concepts of Brahmanic theology, in which Brahm, the infinite, the unconditioned, becomes known only by its productions, but remains itself forever, the invisible root, the unknown cause of all causation. Now obviously, this concept in itself challenged not only Greek theology, but Egyptian and Roman it further challenged Christian theology because it stood with such a tremendous state of complete aloofness that it found very little immediate association with the beliefs of other groups. Yet it may well be that in this concept Plotinus, Iamblichus, Porphyry, Sallust, were close to some abstract formula derived from Plato. Now in the Neoplatonic system, it is from this inevitable intelligible that exists only as a conjectural or conceptional entity that the universe emerges. Now we must pause with these persons for a moment before we go further because there is another fine point that we have to try and clarify. And obviously in the brief survey such as we can make we're not going to be able to clarify all of these points adequately. We can only touch upon them and hope that the picture leads to a constructive general uh, summation of the subject. These uh, Neoplatonists were concerned undoubtedly with the nature, the essential nature of this unknowable. And we find them breaking somewhat within themselves into two groups relating to this particular mystery. One group assumed that the conceptual or intelligible being had a total and complete existence, eternal and forever, in the vastness of the universe itself. The second group had already begun to isolate a psychological concept, namely the total being as a concept exists only within man. Therefore we have two systems. One, that man exists within total being, which is the reality. The other, that the total being exists only in man and is therefore a conceptual creature or being, which can be eternally affirmed, but only exists because of the conceptual power of man himself. 
This could break and did break to form two great systems that are still fighting in the world today. But they were aware of this uh, possible interpretation and did everything they could to clarify their original meaning. In the Neoplatonic system, this eternal, unconditioned existence, by its own inevitables, produces from itself that which is inferior to itself. And this emanation, or perhaps more completely and correctly, this power that oozed from it, that uh, descended out of its own nature simultaneously from all of its parts, uh, the, the Neoplatonist called Nous. And this was the world mind. Now the world mind had by virtue of its own nature a complete and entire dependence upon being. Being, on the other hand, had no actual dependence upon mind. Mind was a condition, and in order for being to assume mind, being must first deny itself. Now we get very close to Buddhism, where, that the, where intellect or mind itself is the first illusion for it is the first restriction or limitation of that which is in itself eternal and inevitable. Uh, Pythagoras referred to mind as the second power, or the power at the root of division. And according to the Neoplatonists, being, having cause to emanate from its own nature, nous, or mind, became captured or held within the net of the vast extent of its own mental or intellectual powers. Thus the conceptual power gave birth to thought. And thought was a product of conception. And the conception is superior to the thought. Therefore there exists a faculty of conception in man's consciousness, which is a creating power superior to mind. This all becomes a little difficult, but it will clear, as uh, somewhat at least, as we proceed. Nous, or the world mind, is also identical in its essential substance with the world soul. Why, in my, why did the Neoplatonists conceive the mind and the soul to be identical? in this almost anticipating modern psychology. They replied, it is identical because mind is the inevitable root of reflection. It is the inevitable ordinator of conduct, the per perpetuator of records, the distinguisher of parts, and therefore is essentially the power by which man can reflect upon his own conduct, whereby man therefore becomes capable of the concept of good and evil, the concept of life and death, the concept of beginning and end. These things all being conceptual within man, inevitably result in the arising in man himself of the compound of his energies and their testimonies, or things done and their consequences. And from this chemistry or alchemy therefore arises the soul power. And the soul power in man is of its own substance and nature identical with the world soul. And the soul in its turn creates from itself, by the extensions of its own energies, what we call the body. And the body bears the same ratio to the soul that nous or universal mind bears to being.
The one point that the Neoplatonists particularly stressed was that the soul was a movable equation. Here again, uh, they are uh, drifting very closely toward Eastern mysticism, with which they may have had direct contact through Alexandria and the caravan routes. The soul, therefore, has of its own nature three potential places of abode or conditions of existence. Soul may remain, that is the human soul, the individual soul, may remain identical with the world soul. This is intimated in the story of the prodigal son by the brothers who did not leave their father's house, but remained at home. The soul may become identical with itself, that is, the individual soul may individualize, becoming, therefore, a living soul, having a separate existence. Uh, to borrow a line from Faust, twixt heaven and earth, dominion wielding. In other words, it may exist in a state of suspension between the world soul and the body below which it has engendered. Or the soul, the human soul, may verge <coughs> toward body, become immersed in it, and as a result of that, lose its own identity by being submerged in or absorbed by the mystery of matter. This is the burden of the great Gnostic hymn, uh, the hymn of the robe of glory, which is a variation again upon the theme of the prodigal son, and this in turn is another variation upon the great theme of the wanderings of Odysseus. In any event, the soul, therefore, may remain with the world soul, or it may become a separate being, having its own existence or it may sacrifice its own natural existence and become absorbed in matter. Uh, the last in the story of Narcissus, who seeing his reflection in the water, uh, plunged into the pool to embrace his own reflection and was drowned. This would be the descent of the soul into body. Uh, the uh, famous fable of Cupid and Psyche carries part of this story also. Uh, the fable was first originated and devised by Apuleius, and in it, it is pointed out that after Psyche, the soul, had descended into the lower worlds, it ran about in a stumbling and erratic manner, unable to follow a true course. And this represented, of course, the soul involved in the complexities of a personal existence. Now here we have something also that we do not have in the older writings of Plato or in most of the uh, teachings of that time, and namely the uh, gradual emergence of the concept of the human soul, not merely as a part of a compound, the soul no longer being merely the rational part of man, but now beginning to take on its own true psychic content and to have a sympathetic relationship with body below and with universal soul above. The adventures of soul in Neoplatonism definitely indicate their belief that what we call man's soul life is really the enrichment of the soul potency by means of experiences either derived from the world or derived from the soul of the world. Those derived from the world are called experience. Those derived from the soul of the world or are called intuition or apperception. The individual soul, therefore, has an internal contact with a superior source, 
and an external contact with an inferior body. Through both of these contacts, energies flow into the soul. And in the ascent of man, from a material to a regenerated condition, the Neoplatonists therefore taught that first the soul must be made comfortable in the body. Then it must be restored to its own life, and finally it must be returned to the world soul or the universal life. Now in this concept then, we begin to recognize that the Neoplatonists identified the conscious part of man with the soul. Now this was uh, also more or less according to the, Pla the Platonic system, for the older Greek philosophers had no term for consciousness as we know it. To them, the consciousness of man was part of his psychic life. Here again we come to the Eastern concept of the sattva, or self, which is not an eternal and imperishable being, but is merely the compound of the various attitudes, convictions, beliefs, ideas, attainments, and limitations of the complete psychic nature at any given time. So here we have the soul capable of returning to the world soul. And in this return, fulfilling its existence on a psychic, emotional, mental level. This in substance is the basic emphasis, and nearly all Neoplatonism is concerned mostly with this problem of the soul. It is not concerned nearly as much with the nature of deity as with the primary problem of what was called the fall of man and the problem of the regeneration of man. Now dealing on this, dealing with this entire subject psychologically as they did, they did not conceive the fall of man to be the result of a curse or of some evil doing. They considered the fall of man to be prim primarily the caused by innocence. In other words, just as the small child finds itself in difficulties and is unable to orient itself or extricate itself because of its own immaturity, it was inevitable that souls, once they had an individual existence, would move towards and verge to involvement in elements and conditions which they did not and could not control. Thus, as the universe is an infinite diffusion of conditions, souls having an individuality immediately were moved to experiment with these conditions following the same instinct that we have today, that the unknown is an endless temptation or an encouragement uh, towards adventure. Plotinus describes individual souls as suspended like effulgent blossoms from the body of the world soul. And he declares that these souls falling into generation like seed falling into the earth cause to generate around themselves the forms which are later to become their bodies. And just as the body of the plant grows from the seed, so the body of man grows from a primordial seed, which is the soul. And it is no more difficult to explain how the soul of man shall cause the body to come forth from it than it is to explain how the, the acorn can cause to come from it the great oak tree. Actually, bodies are built from soul seeds, and these seeds are sown in space. And these individual soul seeds, the moment they begin to build bodies, pass toward evolution or pass toward an ultimate state of re-identification. All bodies 
are extensions of the soul toward unity. The fact that we have hands and feet are not primarily for the convenience of the body, but in order that the soul within the body may attain expression or release. And all release is toward re-identification with the world soul. Thus, the moment the seed is planted in space, at that moment the journey home begins. The journey home does not begin when the individual decides to be good or wise. The journey home begins with the atom, with the electron, with every form of life, conscious or unconscious. The mineral is journeying home the moment it forms its crystals. The plant is journeying home the moment it sends down its root or causes its first small shoot to rise through the earth. All things start home the moment they start releasing. And the release of the psychic energy in the formation of body is the beginning of this long way back to our own far distant native land. Thus Neoplatonism is essentially a doctrine of the redemption of the human soul. But it differed from Christianity in the fact that it did not include any messianic dispensation or any power outside of man as contributing finally to the release of the soul. Neoplatonism did not believe in a fallen humanity, therefore did not believe in a redeemer, any more than it would have accepted a redeemer for the wheat that is cast in the earth and will bear its harvest tenfold. The natural growth of life is inevitable, was an assumption by which their entire concept was motivated. And this, uh, this assumption was rooted in very abstract conceptual ideas concerning the nature of primordial being, which we cannot attempt to go into because they involve not only many mystical speculations, but a great deal of advanced mathematical formula. So we must content ourselves with the simple thought that Neoplatonism is therefore a story of man's growth, and as a story of growth is also a discipline of growth. Now in the problem then, we have again Proclus pointing out certain elements of the Platonic philosophy, which led to a further division between Neoplatonism and other systems growing up in the society around it. One of these was that the entire emphasis in Neoplatonism being upon the release of soul through and from body, and with the complete purpose of life vested in growth alone. Neoplatonism had very little time uh, for the expanding and spreading of economic, sociological, industrial ideas. It was not concerned to any great measure with the extent of man's terrestrial domain. It would never have inspired exploration. It never would have led to this great rise of modern nations such as we know with their intensive competitions, uh, their vast mortal projects. It would never have produced a civilization of individuals highly conscious of the wealth factor. It would not have produced these things, because these people were not of this mind. Here again was one of the reasons they did not survive. They were out of tune with the most natural instincts with which man at that time and in future time also <coughs> has been invested. But in Neoplatonism, the entire project deals with the actual release of the individual. When accused of selfishness and being self-centered, they replied that to their mind, their policy was by far the greater good, inasmuch as the only security that man can know in the material world.
is a security based upon an enlightened civilization in which each individual is doing right. Under such condition, wrong cannot exist. Therefore, the individual who devotes his life to the restoration of his own essential nature, if he increases in number and multiplies and becomes a dominant class in society, nearly all of the false ambitions of men will gradually be overcome. They can only be overcome when they are conquered within the individual and not by legislation or by the collective growth of society, because there can be no growth of society that is not sustained by the growth of the individual. So they held a very strong and definite attitude on this matter. Now it would follow from their thinking that they derived much comfort from other philosophies, including certain phases of Persian mysticism, Hindu philosophy, Buddhism, Greek and Egyptian metaphysics, all of these subjects contributed to the broad pattern of the Neoplatonic concept. And in this concept we gradually see emerging what they might term their way of life, their way of truth. And perhaps this way of truth was stronger than St. Augustine suspected, and not nearly so uncertain as he is inclined to. To imply. Neoplatonism definitely did have a systematic order for growth. This order for growth was based upon the great laws of analogy which they held to be very important, the relations or similarities between man and the universe, and between individual soul and universal soul, individual body and universal body, all these analogies became involved in their disciplines. They began by assuming and affirming that men gather together or live together at this time in a state of common benightedness, and that exceptions to this benightedness are rare, almost unique, and only a few true exceptions exist in any century. And they held that the exception should be the rule and that the only reason why the exception existed is because some individuals, for one reason or another, and they believed in rebirth, did achieve to a greater sincerity of intent and purpose, and that any exception to the general ignorance was clear indication that any and all other individuals could also be exceptions that man possessed within himself a potential which could be redeemed and regenerated, and that until man recognized that this was his primary task, he would never achieve permanent security, peace, or enlightenment. And for this common state in which men live together, uh, the Neoplatonists had the term opinion. And they considered opinion to be the lowest form of man's psychic life. And that by opinion all men are commonly burdened, either by their own opinions or by the opinions of others. And what are opinions? Uh, opinions are parasitical growths. Uh, they are concepts which have no validity having no source in reason or in judgment, arising not from knowledge, but from lack of knowledge. Therefore, a certainty arising from lack of knowledge is called an opinion. A certainty arising from lack of knowledge may be the most certain of all certainties, and there is no individual who is willing to defend realities more industriously then the opinionated are willing to offend their opinion, defend their opinions. Now, why is an opinion wrong? What is about? What is there about an opinion? An opinion is a judgment passed without due examination. An opinion is a conclusion based upon appearances and not upon substances. An opinion is an immature 
ill-defined uh, situation. And it is also the product of an individual degree of non-intelligence, which does not justify an individual arriving at a conclusion. Now, if everyone had to have a license and pay five dollars a year for the privilege of having an opinion, we wouldn't have so many of them. <laughs> but opinions are free, and we are very free with them. And yet, actually, it requires just as much <coughs> wisdom to have a worthwhile opinion as it does to make an adequate diagnosis of an ailment. Therefore, we should go to school, perhaps to a postgraduate, and then a clinic, before we are entitled to have an opinion. And we are not entitled to have any opinion on any subject which we have not specialized. Therefore, when they made poor old Luther Burbank come down from Santa Rosa and make his opinions on theology because he was a great horticulturist, we have the, the tragedy. Namely, that if a person is famous, his opinion on all subjects is supposed to be important. When he has no valid opinion outside of knowledge. And most of our troubles, opinion one form, gossip another, criticism another, arise from, most of our troubles arise from this uh, condition which Heraclitus so well called the falling sickness of the reason. Opinion. Now, opinion to the Neoplatonists meant even more than this. It meant a level. It meant a world living only upon superficial observation of phenomena. An opinion would ma cause a man to say that the sun sets in the west because it appears to. Opinion is again to be measured in the term of uh, Plato's allegory of the cave where all the men down below who had never looked over the edge were quite certain of what existed there and then proceeded to persecute the only man who went and looked and came back and told them but because his findings were different from their opinions he was wrong opinion therefore represents always a majority attitude because according to, uh, to Plotinus, on such levels, the majority must always be wrong. The opinions of the majority, however, must not be confused with the intuitions of the majority, because that is quite different. But opinion is uh, this superficial uh, type of attitude or approach by which, as they expressed it, all things are held in common by exchange, but not by factual knowledge. Therefore, when we say something and affirm it because we have heard it, read it, or been told it, we are passing on an opinion. Now, an opinion usually in Neoplatonism does not apply to a phenomenon that is generally shared by men. Men do not have too many opinions about the fact that water is wet, nor do they have too many opinions about day and night. Opinions, therefore, are most dangerous where facts are the least available. Consequently, most of our most complicated opinions or on levels where together we do not share any adequate factual knowledge. And the moment uh, we attempt uh, to come to a conclusion beyond our knowledge, we fall into opinion, unless we are trained, and by training have learned how to extend the known reasonably and rationally. Now, above opinion and superior to it is sense. Now, sense to the Neoplatonists conveyed um, what we might term common sense, a very rare commodity, but one uh, which is invaluable. Common sense has been held to be certain 
uh, apperceptive or intuitive uh, realizations that we share. Common sense is the expression of subjective experience. Anything that we have gone through ourselves, anything we have done ourselves, or anything we have thoroughly, rationally digested ourselves, may become available to us from the subconscious under the general form of sense. It therefore is that faculty by which primitive people are able to achieve an amazing validity in conduct or in the solution of problem. Sense is the individual solving or approaching an issue on the level of his own intelligence, uh, but with all available observable elements considered. Sense may not infer greatness of reflection, but it does infer breadth of observation and the ability to estimate the relationship of things seen to other things which may not at that moment be apparent. Therefore, it is association. It is the con continuity by which uh, we learn from moving one stone how to move many stones, and how from hollowing out a log to make a boat, we can gradually and inevitably move until we can create a great ocean liner like the Normandy or the Queen Mary. These motions are the gradual extensions of common sense. They are the individuals building upon the foundations of the achieved and moving toward that which must yet be achieved. This also, however, lies on the level of matter, very largely, and material things. But common sense also becomes the second level of philosophy, because common sense produces the homely, practical, natural philosopher. Unschooled, unskilled, he becomes capable very often of a tremendous integrity of penetration. We think of, for instance, a, a slave like Aesop, whose fables show an uncanny penetration. And yet all of these fables represent things which the average person could know, could understand, could experience, but he did. There is nothing involved that is beyond what might be known to a slave. But many slaves would not know it. Common sense represented then that Aesop was able to call upon this experience and find in it the common links with the experiences of innumerable other creatures like himself some in slavery to a physical master and others in slavery to an ambition or a passion or a concept. <coughs> now above the level of sense there comes then the level of knowledge. Now knowledge is more than sense because a sense is a probability based upon experience. A knowledge goes beyond this. A knowledge implies a combination of actual attainment and a measure of experimentation. Therefore, we can say that knowledge could very well Neoplatonically be built upon the Baconian foundation and Bacon followed Neoplatonism. Namely, that knowledge is built upon tradition, Observation, experimentation. Obs uh, tradition uh, makes available to us a wealth of material that may or may not be knowledge, but supplies us with the raw materials relating to fields of endeavor that have been conquered or achieved by others. <coughs> 
Therefore, tradition is actually the historical record of the experiences of other persons. This becomes a valid source of knowledge, but is not in itself knowledge. Therefore, to tradition we add observation. Observation causes the individual uh, to observe the application of tradition to the contemporary uh, events of living. He can see with his own eyes and feel upon his own skin uh, the operation of certain laws, certain facts, and learns more and more uh, to therefore censor tradition as to its validity or its lack of validity. Then he adds a third element, experimentation. And experimentation is the process of putting a belief to action and observing its consequence. Now for no other form of knowledge is there an equal substitute. Because no matter how much we may believe or we may hope, we may fear or we may aspire, all things are subjected to the final test of application. And it is only when we have taken a tradition, observed the world around us and the operations of these traditional factors, then subjected them to the laboratory technique of experimentation either in our lives or on a scientific level, can we then affirm that we are in the possession of knowledge? Such knowledge as belongs to physical things can be usually tested by laws of physical matter. Knowledge relating to intellectual, moral, or spiritual matters must be tested by the laws of these levels, which may be various kinds of application in our own living. If we follow our own advice, we will know whether or not we will fall into the ditch. But we can continue to hold a poor idea forever and never know it is wrong unless we put it to work and watch it fail. That is why so many people with so many ideas seldom if ever apply them. They have a secret suspicion that they are not going to work and they will not expose themselves to this situation. Now above knowledge, we approach gradually to the highest levels of learning, and we come to that which is superior to knowledge, and that is wisdom. And in Neoplatonism, the term wisdom applies primarily to those who have as a motivation or a moving springboard to conduct a well-developed contemplative internal life. Wisdom arises from the contemplation of knowledge. For knowledge in itself always tells more than itself if it is valid. All things known have imponderable overtones. The moment we establish the fact of anything, we come into a vast field of implications relating to that fact, antecedent causes which must be presumed to exist, uh, subsequent effects which must be assumed will follow. So the aura of knowledge extends from itself into the contemplation of principles. The moment, for example, that we become aware of the operation of a law, we are confronted with the necessity for the acceptance of a lawful universe. If water flows downhill, this is a fact which we can transform into knowledge, and through knowledge we can vitalize into utility by using this water to turn a wheel or something of that nature. 
But the moment we begin to contemplate this knowledge, it opens us to another world, a world of imponderables, which must exist in order to support the known fact. Because no fact stands alone. No knowledge is complete as a fragment. Therefore, the contemplation of law and order, the study of a snowflake or a crystal in a rock, the moment we contemplate knowledge and arrive at the inevitable conclusions that knowledge forces upon us, we verge toward wisdom. For wisdom is the creation of a setting in our understanding great enough to encircle all knowledge. For knowledge is suspended from principles, and these principles are its inevitable causes. So wisdom stands as a crowning power, and in wisdom we achieve that degree of development by means of which we are urged or moved toward the life of wisdom. For having observed, having rationally experienced, having reasonably demonstrated, we are inevitably impelled to a personal standard of conduct conformable with the level of wisdom which we have attained. Conduct on a level superior to wisdom cannot be maintained. Conduct on a level inferior to wisdom cannot be tolerated. Therefore, the attainment of wisdom is really the beginning of an internal dominance over externals. Wisdom causes the mind to move gradually and inevitably uh, from an acceptance of effect to a recognition of cause and causes us gradually to transfer our allegiance from particulars to principles. Thus from the understanding and wisdom we come to gradually perceive the outlines of the intelligible deities, the conceivable realities that lie beyond mind. We have now ascended through the levels of body and the soul's three polarizations, its association with body, its association with itself, and its association with the world soul. And we have come to that point in the discipline of Neoplatonism, in which we stand on the threshold of a universe which has gradually enlarged, as it enlarged for Plato, as it enlarged for Plotinus, until at last we stand, as it were, upon the edge of a cliff looking out into an infinity, and our road ends at the edge of the cliff. And there are only three choices possible to us, to retrace our steps, remain on the cliff, or jump into space. Any one of these three courses may be followed, but in all probability, as wisdom cannot be less than itself, we cannot go back, as wisdom will never be content to remain as it is, we cannot stay where we are. Therefore, the very demand of the pressure itself moves us inevitably towards this mysterious step into infinity. This step was the final exercise of Neoplatonism and was that division which is called theurgy. And theurgy is the individual coming face to face with the impossibility of the objective or philosophic or even contemplative attainment beyond wisdom. 
Now he has bridges. And Neoplatonism pointed these bridges out. While man is in ignorance, a glimmer, a glimmer of sense is within him. While he is sensible, a glimmer of knowledge shines within him. When he knows, a glimmer of wisdom shines within him. And when he beyond, goes beyond knowledge and beyond wisdom, a glimmer of something else shines in him. And this glimmering of something else is by means of a bridge or a, a kind of rational magnetic or auric field which surrounds the fact itself and which the Neoplatonists call inspiration or in some cases intuition. In other words, man begins to recognize beyond wisdom a new standard of knowledge a standard of knowledge which is rooted in the substances of realities themselves. In other words, in the conceptual forms which he has called principles and which the ancient Greeks called the gods. In the great orders and hierarchies of conceptual beings, the individual uh, having attained wisdom becomes dimly aware of the magnificent blossoms that are floating in eternal being like the lotus upon the surface of the water. And he realizes, as we all realize finally, that the answer to every question that is vital and is real lies in this profundity in this mysterious something that is forever beyond the grasp of the reason, that is forever beyond the power of the intellect to ordain or integrate. Then we come to the final step in the Neoplatonic concept. Namely, that man, having exhausted the potentials of soul. These having been exhausted because he has exhausted the potential of the world soul. Because the world soul is not identical with being but is subordinate to it. Therefore, as being produces soul, soul is deficient in something. Because the superior is always greater than the inferior and the creator must always exceed his creation. So when we reach the extension or the ultimate of the rational soul through the cultivation of the highest aspects of contemplative wisdom, we have exa exhausted the power of the world soul to carry us further. We then stand as Moses stood overlooking the promised land, but he could not enter. Therefore he lay down and died upon the lonely hills of Moab. And in the, in the Neoplatonism, there comes the same crisis that Buddhism t uh, approaches in the mystery of the Nirvana. Namely, the transition between conditioned and unconditioned existence. And the only solution to every conditioned existence lies in the unconditioned, because only the unconditioned, moving above the level of mind, on the level of conceptual reality, possesses the absolute authority of creation. This authority does not lie in the mind of the deity, but in the will of the deity. Therefore, in a strange way, the will produces the mind. A man, having exhausted the mind, must therefore return to the contemplation of the power of the will, the power of the universal will, which does things because of inevitability. And all things created are right because they are inevitable, not because they are moral or immoral. 
The Neoplatonists then contemplated the possibility of man bridging this interval, and they came to two conclusions, one essentially the Egyptian and the other essentially the Greek. These two conclusions were, first, that man, by the supreme exercise of his own wisdom, could jump into the unknown as a possible action of self-extermination. The individual could destroy his individual existence. He cannot do it until he has exhausted its requirements. In other words, he cannot do it anywhere until he has transcended that existence totally. Having transcended it, he can choose to cast it aside. So that essentially there is a possibility that the Neoplatonists contemplated that the final act of wisdom is to cast oneself into the infinite. Now the second attitude, which is a little less extreme, and gradually gained favor, especially as we find it in the writings of Dionysus and the Pseudo-Dionysus, is the recognition that total being, or totality itself, being in itself the only infinite and the only completeness, that it is conceivable the totality can possess the individual, even though the individual can never possess totality. Therefore, that the ultimate state is the condition of absolute acceptance or absolute receptivity to being. And receptivity to being presupposes the complete extinction of not being within the self. Therefore, if the individual can outgrow his body, outgrow his emotions, outgrow his mind, so that he is no longer dependent upon them, and that they can no longer dominate his character, when the individual is no longer under the limitation of thought, he has therefore exhausted thought. He has exhausted the power of thought over him. The Neoplatonist contemplates this problem. When the individual has outgrown thought, what is left? When he has exhausted mind, and until mind ceases, because it can no longer contribute anything, and mind has to have constant motion for its survival. The mind only lives because it eats the unknown. Lives upon the unknown. Stretching out, consuming it, transforming the unknown into mental food. When the mind has devoured all of the unknown, when the mind would be forced to reach a, st a stasis and remain the same forever, then the mind would cease. So one school, the mystical school, assumed that the individual who has outgrown the mind and can cast it aside, as he casts the body aside, is then capable of the total experience of being. Now Neoplatonism does not assume that this total experience of being is going to be bestowed upon individuals in daily living. It assumes that this total experience is going to be bestowed only at the end of the entire process of growth. Now, the Neoplatonists, however, did have a particular and definite doctrine, namely, that at various stages in the transition periods, particularly through those transitions which relate to wisdom and move toward intuition, when man is reaching the rim of wisdom and his intuitive and apperceptive powers are beginning to grow, he may and does receive an occasional flash, an illumination, an apperception of that which lies beyond. In other words, 
they originated the concept of what we call the mystical experience. They recognized it as flashes of complete integrity, not constantly available, but possible to man under certain conditions, and that by these intuitive or inspirational occurrences, which Plotinus declared he had experienced six times during his life, the individual becomes for a moment aware of some phase or attribute of being, not being in total, but something superior to his present condition. And because such superiority transcends that which is normally experienced, it may be mistaken for an ultimate, but it is not an ultimate. In the mystical experiences related by Plotinus and other Neoplatonists, one particular and interesting element is always present, namely that these experiences present an effulgent revelation of something that is in, around, about, and an essential part of everything that exists. These experiences did not relate to motion. They did not bestow a particular knowledge of any subject. They did not answer any question. In a strange way, beyond our concept of dimension, they simply answered question as it is. Not a question, but the, the entire mystery of question. They bestow the seal of certitude a tremendous authority blazing through the things intellectually or intelligibly uh, comprehended or apperceived. So that suddenly an eternal value or eternal quality bursts through the universe. Man incapable of sustaining the tremendous pressure of this upon himself has only a second or a moment of this experience. And Plotinus was convinced that if it was extended for any length of time, it would consume the individual completely. It, could, it would destroy all of the sensitive cords of contact between the various parts of man's psychic nature because it is too powerful. It is like Zeus appearing in the full panoply of power. It was too much. But through it dimly, the Neoplatonist perceived the reality, being, as an indescribable ocean of fullness in which all things were absolutely and completely sufficient, and that everything in some mysterious way was permeated with this sufficiency, with this ultimate, so that out of the flower in the field, out of the bird in the air, there was suddenly released a sense of absolute integrity of ultimates. The complete certitude of that bird's flight became a dynamic truth in itself. And in the same way, the certitude of man's immortality was impressed upon his own inner life. The certitude, or the seal, as Bainey calls it, of the inevitability of all things by nature good and inevitable, suddenly with complete assumption of authority forced upon the awareness of man, bursting upon him, so that all he could actually do is to inwardly accept unconditionedly the fullness of this implication. To this Plotinus gave the name Illumination. And this Illumination was the ultimate reward of the urging. It was the individual, having practiced and perfected those divine disciplines by which the individual consciousness, with its entire psychic life, 
is moved from a crude and barbarous state gradually towards a human destiny, elevated to an heroic estate, and finally restored in effulgency to the gods, and by the gods themselves returned to the father fountain of all things. Thus the ascent of the soul is by a kind of ladder, a ladder of attainment, and Neoplatonism pointed out that this was not a theological ladder primarily, but a ladder of merited attainment every step of the way. And that this ladder of merited attainment was man's justification. It was his witnessing of his own resolution to grow. He proved his merit by his consecration to the proper and sequential steps of growth on and up to the ultimate end to be attained. Now I said earlier that this concept had a profound effect. It had a very profound effect for the simple reason uh, that in its final contact with the rising uh, church of, Christian, of Christendom, Neoplatonism was officially destroyed. Uh, with the death of Hypatia, the martyrdom of Hypatia, the school in Alexandria ceased. And with the final edict of Justinian, the Greek schools were closed. But the early church took into itself practically the entire concept of Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism became the philosophy of the church for 1200 years. It became the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. It became the philosophy of uh, St. Augustine. It became the basis of the meditational and visual and visionary uh, theories of uh, St. Bernard, of St. Buenaventura. It inspired the entire mystical life of St. Francis de Assis. And gradually moving forward, did the one thing that no one expected to do it to do. It turned man's minds ultimately from theology to economics. And in the 17th century, under the great revival of the Cambridge Platonists, this very Neoplatonism, which had seemingly led to the renunciation of the world, set the foundation for what we call the scientific method of life. Uh, as we go through the series, why we'll be able to explain more and more of how this operated. Until today, the average American citizen's thinking, in almost any subject in which that thinking is reasonably correct, that thinking is 90% Neoplatonic. As Emerson pointed out, all philosophy is Plato restated. And to a great degree, it is true of Neoplatonism rather than of the direct Platonism. Because our entire contact with Plato in Europe and the Near East for a thousand years was through Neoplatonism. Thus, the very fact that we have a democratic form of government, that we have the common law, and that we have law in equity, these things are based largely upon Neoplatonism. Uh, the fact that we have empiric medicine, the fact that we have laboratories to carry on scientific research in infantile paralysis and heart problems, these things are the indirect outgrowth of the conditioning of the European mind during the medieval period by Neoplatonism. So while the system itself seemingly disappeared, it prepared the way for this concatenation of knowledge. It gave us the public school. Comenius, the father of the public school system, was a Neoplatonist. And it began the concept of a grade school, of high schools, colleges, and special institutions. It gave us the whole concept of a gradually, sequentially unfolding knowledge. It prepared also for most of the atomic and physical research of the present time because the uh, Platonic and Neoplatonic concepts of deity as life and energy were based, of course, upon the atomism of Democritus, 
and Lysippus, and the atomic speculations of Socrates. All these things moved together. Neoplatonism carried them across, spread them, and diffused them. And our modern world, in those parts in which it is more or less civilized, and in those parts in which it has more or less of a good spirit, and is seeking to grow, is largely a Neoplatonic world. And most of the morality and ethics of Christendom, Christendom is Neoplatonic. So the diffusion of this subject has been immense. We have only been able to lay a certain foundation for it at this time, but we think perhaps we better let it rest now until next week and give you a chance to sort of catch up and get everything organized. So we'll see you again next week.